Partner. Okay, welcome to EGR 445. In today's lesson, we are going to talk about design of springs. So, first and foremost, what are the different types of springs? So there is a helical spring. So there are different varieties of spring. Mainly, there is a helical spring. Then there is a spiral spring. Then there is a leaf spring. And there is a conical spring. So you must have seen a helical spring that looks something like this. In helical spring, there are two types. One is closed coil helical spring. And second is an open coil helical spring. Now in open coil helical spring, angle of helix alpha is greater than 10. So how does a helical spring look like? So helical spring is basically a wire. So it's something like, like this. And that is wound around a cylinder. So there is this wire. And please understand this wire goes around this cylinder. If you look at the, the spring, this is the helix angle. This is the helix angle alpha. Now, the most important thing is the wire diameter. So we have something called as the, the wire diameter which is small d. And then we have something called as the coil diameter, which is capital D. And capital D by small d, it's considered the ratio C. Capital D divided by small d, it's considered a design parameter C. Now, in the case of closed coil and open coil, the applications are different. So for an example, a closed coil spring would look something like this. This is a closed coil and this is an open coil. So you can have a tension spring or you can have a compression spring. So purpose of spring is to apply tension. Then that's called as the tension spring. If the purpose of the spring is to apply compression, then it's called the compression spring. Now, there are different design principles for helical spring, but at minimum, I want you to understand if you were to apply the force P over here, so this is the load. So this is P, which is load. Then under the action of this load, this coil is going to twist. Under the action of the load, 
this coil is going to twist. So spring design is based on torsion. So helical spring design, the fundamental principle for design is torsion. And I will derive the design equations for the helical spring. For spiral spring, what you have is it's like a torsional spring and you have an inward uh, or outward spiral. And these springs probably you have seen very commonly in watches. And the design principles are similar, but please understand the load applied by spiral spring is different. The purpose of the spiral spring is to apply torque. There is leaf spring and common application of leaf spring is to support automotive chassis. And I'm sure most of you have seen the leaf springs. And then there is a central, there are two central clips. There is a bolt. And then usually what you have is you have wheel and axle that is connected to the leaf spring and the I end, which is the top end, is connected to chassis. If you look at the design of the leaf spring, essentially it's a stacked beam. So what you have is this leaf is nothing but a simple plate and there are different designs. So you can have the design wherein you have a long leaf at the center and then you can have short leaves on the either side or you can have the longest leaf at one end and then you can have short leaves on the other side. So these leaves, the design principle for the leaf spring is based on bending. So if you look at the leaf spring, what you have is you have the longest leaf And this is a very common design. And then you have shorter leaves. So, but if you think about the loading, if you think about the loading, the leaves are stressed in bending. So the fundamental equation for design of leaf spring is using the bending equation. Now there are conical springs so wherein what you have is, you have these types of cones that are stacked on top of each other. And we are talking about purely mechanical springs. There are hydraulic springs. So you have, you can have hydraulic springs. You can have air springs. And hydraulic springs are usually combination of mechanical and hydraulic because please understand air is compressible. So pneumatic springs are compressible. Oil or water is not compressible. So what we do is by selectively making certain parts of the spring rigid, we change the stiffness properties. So if you want to adjust the stiffness properties, you would see some type of combination hybrid spring when you have some type of hydraulic element. There are some springs which are based on um, electromechanical actuation or magnetorheological application. So basically one type of spring is, wherein what you have is you have this magnetic fluid and then what you do is you have these magnets, electromagnets on the side. And initially this is fluid. And then once you energize, this becomes sort of semi-solid. So the resistance offered by that fluid changes. And then you can actually construct a damper out of it. So there is something called as magnetorheological damper which is combination of spring and damper. There is electro-rheological damper. So there are different, different varieties of springs. 
Now, typically, helical springs are used for force application. If you want to apply the forces, tensile or compressive, the helical springs are used. So what are the classic applications of different types of springs? So where do we use springs? So springs are typically used to store energy. Then to exert force or torque. to absorb shocks then to major forces and to change vibration characteristics change vibration characteristics. And some of these applications are pretty obvious. One classic example is air springs. If you are driving a high end car like Mercedes, depending upon the type of ride you want, you can put the vehicle into sports mode or you can put the vehicle into comfort mode. So what happens? When you are using the sports mode, the handling is improved. So how does handling is how does handling get improved? So spring stiffnesses, actually springs are made stiffer. When the springs are made stiffer, the cornering or handling of the vehicle gets improved. Vehicle gets more traction, the body rolls as per the driver input. Now, if you want to make it more comfortable, if you are in a comfort mode, you would actually make the springs a little bit softer. Then what would happen because of that? The body vibrations, the passengers experiencing the vibrations from the road uh, and other road noise, those vibrations get reduced. So springs, they are very important in lots and lots of applications. Springs are also used for energy storage, changing, sometimes the springs can be used to add some type of mechanical advantage. Uh, one classic example for spring is like um, impact hammer. So I don't know if you have seen the impact hammer. In the impact hammer, what happens is there is a spring and every time the motor winds the spring and that spring is released and that actually exerts tremendous amount of force in one shot. So that's like giving an impact. So springs are used to provide mechanical advantage. Now, what are the important dimensions of the spring? So important dimensions. Important dimensions. So there is something called as, uh, just I said, coil diameter. So there is wire diameter, there is coil diameter. So wire dia is D, coil dia is capital D. There is something called as the spring index. Which is the ratio of capital D to small d. Then there is free length. Which is typically in tension. Then you have solid length, which is in compression. And last but not least, the pitch. Now let's look at the fundamental design principle behind a helical spring. So I'm going to draw a helical spring. 
So this is how a silical string looks like. is how a helical string would look like. And the helical string would have ends on either side. So so once you apply the load P, please understand you have the wire diameter and you have the coil diameter. This is the coil diameter. And then here, that's the wire diameter, small d. So if you think about the way this spring is loaded, spring is subjected to direct shear and shear because of torsion. So I want you to visualize, if you apply the load P for a second, imagine that this load P is acting on that wire diameter that cross section area is parallel to the line of action of force, which means you have the direct shear, but also understand that this guy is actually applying a torque. So this guy is actually applying a torque. So I'm gonna call this W just for consistency. This lever arm is applying a torque. So there are two stresses, so total stress, Fs is equal to the direct stress Fd plus torsional stress. Direct stress is W divided by pi by four, small d square. Torsional stress is given by T divided by J multiplied by R. So I would continue W pi by four d square plus torque here is W multiplied by R, which is D by two. J is pi T raised to four by 32 and R is going to be D by two. Now, please understand in this equation, you have small D, you have capital D. So what I can do is I can actually combine this equation and I will write this equation here because that is the most important equation. I can combine this equation by taking W and D out. If I take the W and D out, I land up with this equation 8 WD divided by pi D cube 1 plus D divided by two capital D. So this is the equation for stress for the helical spring. So once again, let's identify W is the load, small d is the wire diameter, capital D is the coil diameter. And just in case, if in case if you want to know how the yeah question screen bigger, screen bigger okay. Uh, let me see. Is this good? Okay. Now, uh, so please understand. We already have something called as spring index and spring index is the ratio of capital D by small d that is denoted by C. So I can simplify this equation in terms of spring index. Now a word of caution, this equation assumes 2D forces or 2D stresses. However, if you look at the spring, Spring has is in three dimensions. So clearly this is not the accurate representation. So, but this is a good first order approximation. So the equation can now be written as Fs 
is equal to eight W D divided by pi D cube one plus one divided by two C. This is the equation considering stresses in two dimensions because it's purely linear case. But ideally, spring is in three dimensions. So clearly, this approximation is not going to be valid if we really, really want to look at the stresses in the spring. So what do we do? So to account for the spring when it is loaded in three dimension, there is a concept which is called as the Wall's factor. So the, this is how the designers take care of this. So eight W D divided by pi D cube multiplied by K. This K is equal to one divided by one plus uh, divided by two C for 2D stresses. And this K is four C minus one, four C minus four plus 0 0.615 divided by C for 3D stresses. And this guy is called as the Wall's factor. Now, what does Wall's factor do? If you think about it, let's try to understand what is going on here. 2D approximation, my K is equal to one plus one divided by two C. However, when I do with, uh, when I start with 3D approximation, that factor K is increased. And that increased value of that factor K is to account for the complex stress condition because of the 3D loading. And that equation is given as 4C minus one divided by 4C minus four plus 0 0.615 divided by C. And many a times, if you look at the spring design problems, they will tell you that use a 2D approximation or use a Wall's factor, or sometimes they will give you Wall's factor. Sometimes they will ask you to find out Wall's factor from the design data book. And again, uh, there are different corrections to the Wall's factor depending upon the spring loading, but at bare minimum, if you are going to design the spring based on 2D loading, your K is going to be one plus one divided by two C. If you are going to design the spring based on 3D loading, it would be four K is equal to four C minus one divided by four C minus four plus 0 0.615 divided by C. So that is how this equation needs to be used. So there is one more equation in spring design that is very important, which is called as the deflection. So deflection of spring. So deflection of spring is given as delta and that equation is given as 64 W R cube N divided by GD raised to four. So this equation comes from the deflection equations in mechanics of material. So how does this look? So W is the load. R is equal to the coil diameter divided by two. N is equal to number of turns. G is equal to modulus of rigidity. And understand spring design, helical spring design is purely based on torsion. 
so the the g value which is the shear modulus or modulus of rigidity will come in the picture these are the two main equations for spring design and what i want to do now is i just want to give you uh, a sort of a design process for the closed coil helical spring so these two are the main equations for the spring design and now let me give you the recipe and then we'll work through some problems but before i give you the design recipe are there any questions at this point yeah what what is the pressure when you deflect the spring okay so uh, what i'm going to do is i'm going to try to draw a three dimensional view of spring okay and this is just an exaggerated view do you agree this is this looks like spring imagine you apply the load here you apply the load here for a minute think about the cross section here do you agree with me that this cross section is actually getting twisted so basically as you pull you have that on the cross section you are getting a twist this means torque it's not bending it's actually twisting so as we are applying the load because of the curvature of the spring basically the wire wire diameter uh, the section modulus gets twisted and that's what is causing the twist so any other questions from online students or in person students okay so let me give you the design process or design technique design of closed coil helical spring so step 1 find maximum load w on spring and this maximum load w can be defined in multiple ways sometimes that spring is given an in, in an application setting so let me show you an example a classic example is internal combustion engine wherein what you have is you have some sort of a rocker arm and then you have some sort of a cam here and what you want to do is you want to design this spring you know the force given by the rocker arm so this force is f please note the force on the spring will be dependent on the lens l1 and l2 so f multiplied by l1 by l2 will be equal to w which is force on the spring sometimes you can have some additional components in between for mechanical advantage sometimes you can have you can have a spring used in a spring balance it spring can be used in maybe not at the straight angle but or at an inclined angle so the spring is at theta so you have to align the spring and find out the load that is perpendicular to the spring so basically going through the center line of the spring so maximum load is the load that is going through the center line of the spring second find torque on the spring torque on the spring and here there is a little bit of design iteration and we will we will actually work this problem out because torque is given as w multiplied by d divided by 2 but many a times we don't know what is the value of capital d so there is an iteration we have to go back and forth and i will explain that to you when i work out the problem then third step is find maximum shear stress maximum shear stress 
and that maximum shear stress is nothing but the direct stress plus torsional stress and that equation is i'm just going to write this down as tau total is equal to 8 wd divided by pi d cube multiplied by k and this k will depend upon whether you are looking at the 2d case or looking at the 3d case so if we are looking at 2d case k is given as 1 plus 1 divided by 2c if you are looking at 3d case that is given as 4c minus 4 4c minus 1 4c minus 4 plus 0.615 divided by c and the problem will stay whether to use the 2d case or 3d case in some cases a side note in some cases k may be given at us may be given then step number 4 determine diameter d and c is the design parameter so spring index is the design parameter so assuming small d is known you can find out the value of capital d as c multiplied by small d next step is we have to find out find do which is the outside diameter of the spring which is given as so let's rather than giving the equations let's let's try to find out how do we find out these parameters so this is how the spring looks so this is the nominal diameter this is the nominal diameter what you have is you have half of the diameter here half of the diameter here so outside diameter is going to be d plus small d then inside diameter is equal to d minus small d the next step is find the number of turns find number of turns and the equation for that is delta is equal to 64 r cube so 64 w r cube n r cube n divided by gd raised to 4 now at this point i want to explain couple of key things here so please note when we get to this step step number 6 r which is d by 2 is known small d is also known w is known so at this point either they will give us the value of delta that means the space or the the, the amount of uh, distance between two ends of the spring or the deflection that we allow as designer yeah in the previous slide yeah why d sub o and d sub i are important for the design because what happens is so consider an application wherein you want that spring to sit on a rod okay so clearly 
that rod should be able to fit or should be able to go through the spring which means the diameter of the rod should be less than the inside diameter of the spring so that's why that inside diameter is important now consider another application where the spring is guided so basically what you have is you have an outside guide and then what you have is you have the spring that is sitting inside so the diameter of the outside guide should be equal to or greater than the outside diameter of the spring that's why those inside and outside diameters are important next thing that is if there are any questions please ask okay this distance is called as the pitch distance so this is the pitch of the spring so at this point we know the value of r we know the value of d we know the value of w and depending upon what is given to us we can either find the value of delta or we can find the value of n in in 90% of the cases delta will be given to you say for an example the application is spring balance so let me give you an application so what you have is application is a spring balance so you have a spring and this spring is used to measure something so many a times for the spring balance application they will not give you the value of delta or value of w directly but instead they will give you something called as the stiffness but please note stiffness is nothing but w divided by delta so what you can do is you can substitute the value of stiffness as a ratio of w by delta and still find out the number of turns in certain cases for an example in the internal combustion engine what you have is you have the spring on one side you have the rocker arm and you have the cam shaft and the the cam on the other side so they would give you the value of delta over here the amount of deflection that the spring will uh, will be subjected to so the amount of deflection that is allowed on the spring and then you would use that value to find out the number of turns for the spring and i'll work out the problem and in that case uh, it, it will be clear the next step is determine free length of spring now how do you determine the free length so please understand we know the value of pitch now and you notice that if i were to add these coils they will get added so i will have diameter one diameter there will be say one more diameter then one more diameter so on and so forth so if i can start adding the diameters and then add some clearance that would give me the total number of uh, or, or or basically the total length of the spring so the equation which is lf which is called free length is going to be n which is number of turns multiplied by diameter plus n minus 1 multiplied by some clearance so this is for the clearance now if you want to do compressed length then again what you'll do n times d plus n minus 1 multiplied by clearance plus some reference delta max that will be given to you and next thing is typically uh, step number 8 which is the pitch of the coil which is nothing but p which is delta plus 0.1 multiplied by delta divided by number of coils so this is d so this is 0.1 for this is d this is diameter 
and this is the clearance. And last step is energy stored in spring. So if you look at the linear spring, force versus deflection characteristics of the linear spring, they are something like this. So if you look at the energy stored, energy stored, energy and work, they are equivalent. So energy stored is equal to work done, which is F multiplied by delta by two which is nothing but the area of this triangle. So this would be one half W times Delta is the energy store in the spring. So these are the steps in spring design. Uh, any questions at this point? So, yeah. Is this math only for springs that have kind of a coil shape where they can twist or yeah this is just for helical springs okay. closed coil helical springs wherein the helix angle is less than 10 degrees those are the most common springs that are used uh, in industrial applications so that's why this is the design design of closed coil helical spring any any other questions? Yeah. We follow the same procedure for compression springs and tension springs. Yes, you would follow the same procedure for the compression springs and the tension springs. Then let me take an example. Design a helical spring. for safety wall under following condition. Diameter of wall seat is equal to 100 millimeter operating pressure one newton per millimeter square max pressure or max closing pressure is equal to 1.075 newton per millimeter square Lift of valve at max pressure six millimeter, max shear stress four hundred Newton per millimeter square. And I want you to take a notice of this. The maximum shear stress is 400 because spring steel is used in this application, not mild steel. Mild steel shear stress would be somewhere between 40 to 45 Newton per millimeter square. But in this particular application, uh, a spring steel is used. That why, that's why the maximum stress is 400 Newton per millimeter square. Value of G, which is the shear modulus, is 84,000 Newton per millimeter square. Spring index is equal to 5.5. So sometimes they give you the value of spring index. Sometimes the spring index value is not given. But spring index is a design parameter. So for particular app spring application, you can look at the design data book and that will give you the value of C. 
which is the spring index. So if you think about spring index, what is this spring index? It is the ratio of the coil diameter to the wire diameter. And now depending upon the application you are looking at, depending upon the energy storage, depending upon the, uh, the duty, whether it's light duty, heavy duty, the value of C would be different. But usually for normal applications, the spring index would vary anywhere between 4.5 to 6.5. So those are the common variations of the spring index. So you would see spring index going from 4.5 all the way up to 6.5. In certain specialty springs, you can have a very small spring index or you can have a very large spring index. Uh, spring index. So what are those applications? For an example, the, the springs in precision watches, springs in the precision measuring equipment, they will have a, a, a different spring index depending upon the application that is used, depending upon the accuracy that you want, depending upon the size that is available. Okay, so now we have to design the spring. Now here, the some of these values are not given to us directly. So let's study the application. So what we have is we have a safety valve. So what does that mean? So safety valve, think about that this valve is sitting over here. And there is this spring. So this spring, so there is this spring. So this is the spring that we want to design. So what happens is, so maybe this is a relief valve. So this is a safety valve. So if the pressure is operating pressure is one Newton. So there is a fluid here. So let's say that there is this fluid. So there is this fluid. And what happens is, if the pressure here, if the fluid pressure is one Newton per millimeter square, the wall would remain closed. The diameter of this wall is 100. The wall would remain closed. But when the pressure goes to 1.075, at that time, the wall opens up. So at 1.05, the valve would open up. And when the valve is open up, then it, when it opens, the maximum deflection is nothing but uh, six millimeters. So when the valve opens, the deflection is six millimeter. So now we want to design this spring for this valve application. So once again, let's understand what is happening. Initially, this fluid is at one Newton per millimeter square pressure. So there is pressure of one Newton per millimeter square that is acting on this uh, valve diameter, valve of diameter 100 millimeter. But the spring is going to push this valve down which means it's going to supply the force that is equal to the fluid pressure multiplied by the area of the valve. And that would keep this valve closed. However, as soon as the pressure goes to 1.075, then the, the valve opens up and the lift or the deflection of the spring is nothing but six millimeter. So that gives us actually the deflection value and that gives us the load value. So let's start first and foremost, normal spring force, normal spring force. When valve is closed, is pi by four times 100 square 
मल्टीप्लाइड बाय वन न्यूटन पर मिलीमीटर स्क्वायर फोर्स ड्यूरिंग ओपन फोर्स वॉल ओपन इज इक्वल टू पाई बाय फोर टाइम्स हंड्रेड स्क्वायर टाइम्स वन पॉइंट जीरो सेवन फाइव so this spring has to operate between these two uh, forces and the deflection between open and close so the deflection is equal to 6 mm so i'm going to find out these two forces so the normal spring force with my calculation it's 7853 the force when the spring uh, the maximum spring force Which is eight four four three. So I can find out the stiffness. Stiffness is change in the load divided by deflection, which is eight four four three minus seven eight five three divided by six. That gives me ninety-eight point three newton per millimeter square. So ninety-eight point three newton per millimeter square is the the stiffness of that spring. Now in this particular problem, it is not given to us whether we have to use the two-dimensional approximation or we can go with the three-dimensional approximation. So either approach is fine, but I'm going to go with the three D approximation. so consider 3d stress condition which means k is equal to 4c minus 1 divided by 4c minus 4 plus 0.615 divided by c and here i will substitute the values 4 Multiplied by five point five minus one, four multiplied by five point five minus four plus zero point six one five divided by five point five, and this wall factor comes around one point two seven. Now what we can do is we can use the equation tau total. Is equal to which is the total stress is equal to eight W D divided by pi D cube multiplied by K which is the Wall's factor and I will substitute value of eight multiplied by W so we we'll need to take W as max load and if you look at the max load it is eight four four three. So eight four four three multiplied by the diameter. Clearly, we don't know what the diameter is, but we know capital D by small d is equal to five point five. So I can write here five point five times d divided by pi d cube multiplied by one point two seven, and the total stress is given as. Four hundred newton per millimeter square, and from here, I can find out the value of D, and I get twenty millimeter. So this is quite a big spring. So diameter is twenty millimeter. Capital D is equal to C times D, which is one hundred and ten millimeters. D outside. Is capital D plus D, which is one thirty millimeters. D inside is equal to capital D minus D, which is equal to hundred and so ninety millimeters. Next step is finding the number of turns. So number of turns. And this is given by n, 
So please equation, please see the equation is 64 R cube N W divided by GD raised to four. But please note W by delta is equal to stiffness. And we already found out the value of stiffness, which is 98.3. So I will substitute this equation here. And this equation, so is going to be G D to the power four divided by 64 R cube times W is multiplied by Delta is equal to N. So I took the terms that were present on the right hand side on to the left hand side, substituting the values G is equal to 84,000. 20 to the power 4, 64. So 110 by 110 by 2 cube multiplied by uh, the stiffness is 1 divided by 98.3. That gives me the value of n. So when you solve this equation, n is equal to 13. Next, free length, free length is equal to n times d plus n minus 1 times d multiplied by 0. Point, n minus d multiplied by 0. 0.1. So the free length equation uh, is yeah, n minus 1, 0. Point, 0 0.1. So this equation is 13, 20 plus 13 minus 1 times 0 0.1, which is 272 millimeter. And last equation, which is the pitch, is D plus clearance. So P is 20 plus one, which is equal to 21 millimeter. So this is how you will design a helical spring. Any questions about the helical spring design or the steps in helical spring design? I believe uh, there is uh, an example or, or a homework that ask you to design a helical spring. Is that right? So there is a homework that actually asks you to design the helical spring. And so you would follow these steps and then you would actually find out the dimensions of the helical spring. Now, let me give you the recipe for the leaf spring. So in leaf spring design, there are two techniques. But what I would do is, I will give you a, a basic idea. What is the simplest leaf spring? So the simplest leaf spring is nothing but a bee. You agree with me? That least simplest leaf spring is nothing but a B. So what, how would I make this into a leaf spring? I would add eyes. So this is where the spring get attached. And then I would add the anchor point, something like this. So there will be an anchor point. Now, believe it or not, this is the simplest way a leaf spring can be designed. Now for small applications, uh, like when the loading is not significant or you just want uh, the, the compliance, you don't want a significant rigidity, a single leaf a spring would work. However, if you want to add more leaves, you increase the strength of the spring. So I'll give you two procedures. 
So procedure one. And these procedures are given in the textbook. So first step, we determine strength of each leaf. And that comes from the bending moment equation, which is F divided by Y multiplied by I. So please understand the design equation for leaf spring design is M divided by I is equal to F divided by Y. So what I'm trying is, I'm trying to find out the maximum moment each leaf can support. So this is the first step. Then determine number of leaves. So if I know small m is the maximum bending moment the leaf can sustain, to find out number of leaves, I can find n is equal to total bending moment divided by small m, which is the bending moment supported by each leaf. Then next step. So I just want to give you an idea. The equation for the bending is m divided by i is equal to f divided by y is equal to e divided by r, where e is the Young's modulus and r is the radius of curvature. So what happens is in the spring design, you have to find out the radius of curvature. And this radius of curvature is given by r is equal to e multiplied by i divided by capital M, which is nothing but the total bending moment. And the last but not least, the last step is find center deflection. And that center deflection is delta is given as L square, which is L is this distance, L square divided by Eight R. So R from here would go in here. So once you find the radius of curvature, you can find out the center distance. And this process will give you uh, good results, but please understand. Whenever you start with this process, you have to select certain certain leaf dimension. So for that, you will refer to the design data book and find out the recommended sizes for the leaf springs for a particular application. And you'll start with those basic sizes. Let me give you alternate approach. And this approach will also work. This is procedure two. Here, first and foremost, determine B by T ratio for each leaf. So for example, if you look at the leaves, each leaf is like a beam. So this is B. And this is T. So you find out the B by T ratio. Step two, determine effective length, which is L is equal to L 
L minus center band. So center band is basically this guy. This center band. Next step is equate the maximum bending stress with maximum bending stress to uh, full length leaf. So once you do that, you will be able to find out the value of T because here is how it goes. If you look at the simply supported beam, if you look at the simply supported beam, this is the assumption how that leaf is loaded. This is the maximum on the full length leaf. So if the days W is acting at the center span, the maximum bending moment M max is equal to W. This length is L. WL by four. And FB, which is the bending stress, is given as 18 m divided by bt square 2 times ng plus 3 times nf. Now, what is this ng and nf? So let's look at the way the springs are constructed. So typically, the spring would have some leaves that are full length then there would be some leaves that are partial length. So N, uh, NF is the number of full length leaves and a G is graduated number of graduated leaves. So in this case, NF is equal to three, NG is equal to three. And there are design guidelines that will tell you that you should have minimum three, four, five full length leaves. You should have minimum one, two, three uh, uh, graduated leaves. Sometimes that information would be given to you in the problem. Sometimes you have to refer to the design data book and then find this equation. So please understand in this equation, you know the material of the leaf. So basically, you know the spring material. So this guy is known. You know the application, then that means you know the value of M. These two parameters come from the design data book. These two parameters come from the design data book and in the design data book, it will show you preferred numbers for B by T ratio. So B by T ratio, preferred ratio will be given in design data book. So which means you can find out the value of T from this equation. Once you know the value of T, uh, you can actually uh, go through the process find the total length and then actually draw a nice diagram. So let me show you how would it look like. So this is the full length leaf. This is the eye end. Then you can have graduated leaf. can have, then usually there is a support plate at the bottom. This is the support plate. There is a support plate on top. And usually there are bolts. <coughs> uh, 
that hold them together. And usually what you have is you have some type of an axle or something or some type of a chassis, something supporting, supporting that. So you have U-bolts. These are U-bolts. Then what you have is, and then here there are clips. So clip, this distance is L. This is the full length leaf. This is the eye end. These are the graduated leaves. This is the full length. And either you can use procedure, you can either you use procedure one or you use procedure two. You should be able to find out the dimensions and you can actually add those dimensions on the sketch. So with this, we finish spring design. Uh, yeah, question? Yeah, there is a deflection, but we ignore that for the design purposes. So uh, clearly, if you look at, and again, the same thing. Uh, if I want to design the spring, I would find out the basic dimensions of the spring. And then I would perform just like quarter or knuckle joint a finite element analysis that will give me more realistic view of the stresses. So the dimension that the basically the, the back of the envelope calculations based on the mechanics of material principles, they will give you a starting point. And most of the times the dimensions that you find they would work well. But then when you go to industry with these dimensions, you go select a spring, either from MacMaster car or maybe Granger, pull that spring into your CAD software and then perform the finite element analysis, which means you apply the constraints, apply the loads, look at the deflection and look at the state of the stress. If you look at the spring, the spring, the bolts, U-bolts, they clamp. So if you look at the assembly, there are some contact stresses that are present. We ignore those. But when you do the finite element analysis, you can actually define the type of contact between the leaves, define the point of the, the type of contact between the U-bolts, the support clip and support plate. And that will give you a realistic distribution of the stresses. And then you can see the deflection. So uh, how would the spring deflect under the different, under the action of load? Yes. So I've seen leaf springs used on older cars. Yeah. Is that just older ways of running suspension or are they, is there a benefit of using leaf springs as opposed to uh, cable? Leaf springs are cheaper and they are rugged. So they basically, uh, they are difficult to, so basically if you want to change the stiffness, you can't change the stiffness with leaf springs. So, so, so where would the leaf spring be used? For trucks, for uh, uh, or dumpers, or maybe tankers, where the purpose is the load carriage, but not the comfort of the passengers. And in that case, the leaf springs are used. Leaf springs, they last a long, long time. But on the other hand, if, the, if it's a comfort passenger car, or if the comfort is something that you have in mind, then you would use the, the coil springs. Okay, with that, I'm gonna stop recording and I will see you on Thursday. Uh, any question, concerns? Ideas, doubts, thoughts?